صل على النبي على آل الآل رسول الله خير الأنام وآله يا رب صل على النبي الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله وفي نعمه يكافي ومزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد اذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاولين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاخرين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملل على الى يوم الدين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلك الارض ومن عليها انت خير الوارثين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير النفع انتفاع والافاده والاستفاده والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وبسنه الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلاله على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Looking at the commentary of, of the Burda, Imam al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala He's reached in the chapter of the prophetic miracles, the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam Which in, in the language of the Arabs and the way that Imam al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala brings is al-mu'jizat Or the plural of it is al-mu'jizat And there are different types of what we know or what we'd call um, suspensions of the norm A mu'jizat or a miracle is what is known as a suspension of the normal khariq al and when this is maybe what takes us into the science of theology more so and so when you look at the different ahkam or different um, judgments inside of the science of theology and in the very beginning of the chapters of theology they bring something that is known as al-hukm al-adi al-hukm al-adi al-hukm al-adi more so for us is what we call laws yani scientific laws natural laws or the like in the Arabic language and theology they define it as ifbatu amrin bi amrin or anhu abra tikrar and it's when you affirm an effect upon the existence of an apparent cause due to repetition based upon repetition so anytime we see sort of effects or scientists see effects and they sort of quote unquote they identify the apparent cause and then that effect is brought about more than one say two or more and that's going to be called what you call a law and in theology they call it al-hukm al-adi al-hukm al-adi and obviously we as muslims we have a very very um, clear position upon yani, the nature of how the universe yani, quote unquote seems to operate and it's sort of really important that we sort of see it that way our rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama in his famous prayer allahumma arini haqqa haqqa oh allah show me reality as reality really is and not as i perceive it to be and many of us, unfortunately, that we sort of, um, our perceptions, quote unquote, of the world around us become dogma. And they become theological for us. I, we believe that's how the world is. With the nature of the, the, the mission of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is to pluck each and every single one of us out of the illusion, such that we operate from beyond the illusion. And we gaze at these haqqaiq, these realities, as they are in and of themselves. And so if you took an example of like fire, yani fire burns, so they say, uh, theologically we as Muslims, we believe that's an illusion, that fire does not burn. Nor does fire have any potency to burn. Nor is there any intrinsic connection between yani, fire and the quote-unquote sensation of burning. But that is just as it seems to be. It's what you call a hukm al-adi. Okay, it's a customary ruling. Uh, it's, an, it's just an apparency or an illusion inside of the universe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, But the people of Sunnah wal Jama'ah, their opinion, our opinion Is that whenever we see any fire touch paper and we see the sensation of burning Quote unquote, become apparent to us In reality, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's burning the paper directly Okay Yani indaha laysa biha I mean, even the slight difference the theologians give, if you actually believe that when fire touches paper and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that instant, he gives fire a potency to burn the paper, that is bid'ah, that is heresy, it's a heretical belief. 
We don't believe that fire has anything to do whatsoever with the sensation of burning, but it's just as it seems to be for us, okay? That's the Islamic position in that regard, and that's really important in terms of the context, because the context is about mu'jizat, miracles. And miracles are a suspension of quote-unquote that apparent norm. I, the nature of a miracle is that it plucks you from within the illusion, so that you stand from beyond the illusion, and now to real haqqa haqqa, that you'll see reality as reality really is. And now you'll see, and as they're called in English, the act of God directly. Eh? And it's going to be no mistake whatsoever for the onlooker that this is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is no rational, no natural, no scientific explanation for the phenomena whatsoever. And we're not speaking of hidden laws inside of the universe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, like maybe some like magic, sihr, as an example, which is the ability for the human being to access more subtle laws inside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, quote unquote subtle laws. And that's not what we're speaking about. When we speak about miracles, miracles defy everything. Eh? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifesting his act, the ra'i al ain evident for each and every single one who sees it, to believe in it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those suspensions of the norms are in the Arabic language, there are going to be different terms that are going to be employed. And those terms are employed in accordance to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests this suspension at the hands of. Okay, so when it manifests at the hands of a prophet, you're going to employ the term mu'jiza. And that's what Imam al Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala uses here. A mu'jiza. When it manifests at the hands of somebody who's, who's of known piety, what we call a wali, you're going to call that a karama. A karama. When it manifests upon the hands of somebody who's from the laity of Ahlul Islam, and you can call that an i'ana. An i'ana. And when it manifests upon the hands of somebody who claims prophecy, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to obey, you can call that ihana, ihana. Or if it manifests upon the hands of a Dajjal, like the Dajjal, the Antichrist, at the end of time, then that's what you call istidraj, istidraj. So there are different terms that the ulama of theology will employ, depending upon whom this suspension of the norm manifests. And what it also was at the hands of, what it also sort of you know, informs each and every single one of us that the phenomenon of miracles is not just for the prophets themselves. Although the prophets have a radically quote unquote different type of miracle. Because of a radically different type of message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send to creation. If Allah ta'ala sends that message to the hands of a wali, a, a, a person whose piety is known, as we said, it's called the karama. And the Arabic language with karama is, is an honorific miracle. It's about honoring that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's on the hands of the laity, when they, they use the word iyana, it's an assisting miracle. It's about fortifying the faith of, what, of the common believers. If it's upon the hands of someone who claims something that is not theirs from the people of Kufr, then that's what's called ihana, abasement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to abase that individual. And then if it's on the hands of the Dijjal or somebody who's like the Dijjal, like the Prophet sallallahu he said that there are 30 antichrists inside of my ummah. So if it's on the hands of any one of those, then you call it istidraj. Istidraj. Istidraj is like an incremental, incremental yeah, or a miracle that takes somebody into a state of disbelief and destruction in increments. As Allah Ta'ala says, and as the Dirijuhum, min haythu la ya'alumun, wa umlilahum in nakaydi mateen. As Allah Ta'ala said, that we shall take them in increments, in degrees, min haythu la ya'alumun, from where they perceive not. Wa umlilahum, but we shall lower this down to them in nakaydi mateen. Then my stratagem is fame, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says. But our topic is the mu'jiza. And this is the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to creation upon the hands of somebody he's chosen, that he's chosen for himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who retain prophets and those who retain messengers. The words mu'jiza in the Arabic language, it comes from the word ajaz, ayn, jim, zay, ajaz. And the word ajaz in the Arabic language is the opposite of qutra. It's about incapacitation, incapacity. And i'jaz, which is with mu'jiza, the Arabic language, viziyat al-hamza, that it's about incapacitation. Okay, I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, incapacitating. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incapacitating? 
from a perspective that are two, although one incapacitation is positive and the other incapacitation is negative. The first type of incapacitation is the incapacitation of the Prophet themselves. Okay, there's an incapacity of the Prophets to have manifested that which is just manifested upon their hands. Na'am bashar, wa laysa kal bashar. They're human, but they're not like human, but still that which manifests upon the hands of the Prophet in question, he does not have the capacity, quote unquote, under any circumstances to manifest that reality. And so you are clear, the onlooker is clear, this is not from him. Okay, and then the second thing, which is a negative incapacitation, is that the nature of the ijaz of the mu'jizat of the Prophets, the miracles of the Prophets, that there is some type of tahaddi, there's some type of um, challenge to the Prophets themselves. And if somebody's challenging the Prophet, somebody doesn't believe, they don't believe that this person's a Prophet. And that's really, really important because in a sense what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in the life and times of our Rasul, we look at some of the miracles of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only pointing at the Prophet who's been incapacitated sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam such that you know this could not have came from him. But likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also shining the heart, shining the light upon hearts of those who are present inside of his environment. Why? Because there's somebody in his environment who doubts who he is. Many times you'll see the person openly doubt, like we'll see with the issue of Quraysh, miracle that manifests upon the hands of the Rasul, because Quraysh yet a because the Quraysh are challenging the Prophet to prove he's a Prophet. It's clear where the doubt is, in the hearts of the Kuffar, of the disbelievers of Quraysh. But often you will see that the miracles will manifest, he's, he's right in the midst of his own companions, and in the outward sense, everybody believes he's Rasulullah, Rasul Allah. But there's a heart, heart that is present that doubts who he is. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now manifests the miracle upon the hands of the Rasul in order to remove that doubt. And so that we get two realities here in our interaction with the miracles of the Prophets themselves and the, the miracles of our Prophet who has more known recorded miracles than all of the Prophets combined, combined. And sometimes you hear Ahlul Islam, people from Islam, يعني, who will say that the, our Rasul doesn't have miracles. They'll say, the only miracle of the Prophet is the Quran. It, it's said upon the tongues of people who obviously are ignorant of the Prophet وسلم, and his life and times. One of the things that Busayri wants to make sure we get, the Quran is a distinct miracle. That's why it's the chapter after. This is the chapter of the miracles of the Rasul وسلم, and the least things you get from that, that he has, mashallah, tabarakallah, from amongst miracles, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, more recorded miracles than the entire corpus of the prophets combined, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. If you're a person of disbelief inside of your heart, the first thing that you get like Quraysh is that miracles that they only increase you in distance from the Prophet and it's rare uh, that you will see a disbelief in the time of the Rasul when they see a miracle of the Prophet that the heart will flip into the opposite direction so that they'll believe in the Prophet rare, rare, it doesn't happen okay, because they're doubters they're sophists and you're just doubting the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. That's one result you get from people who engage the prophetic miracles. Uh, and so therefore it's a problem because therefore the actual miracle is, becomes like a hujjah, a proof against. But for the people who have faith inside of their heart, in the miracles, to ziduhum qurba, that it increased them in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. And so that's positive for the people of faith, although faith at times, times, ya'tarihi shak, that it can be subject to doubt. In faith, it can be subject to doubt. And in faith, khalas, akada, the nature of faith with human beings. Okay? And sometimes when your faith is upon Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can manifest a miracle, a khalas, thereby takes your, your faith into a state of increase. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost to embed faith inside of our hearts. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yurina qudratahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us his omnipotence and power inside of creation at the hands of those who are proximate to him. So that it only serves to increase us in faith and in proximity unto him subhanahu wa ta'ala and unto his messenger sallallahu alayhi 
Mungu ala alihi wa sahibi wa sallama and so, so these are the mu'jizat but if we only knew Ahlul Islam, people of Islam yani every single event that you see in creation is a suspension of the norm it's only your perception that yani brings about some type of normality to the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts inside of creation Sunnah Allah and the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala customarily acts inside of his creation and you find no alteration in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts but from a perspective that is the perception of man and because the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique there's not a single act that the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala does such that it resembles another act and you're the one who brings about some type of resemblance but in the case of the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala al-wahdaniyatul mutlaq al-ahadiyatul mutlaq subhanahu wa ta'ala it's absolute uniqueness subhanahu wa ta'ala tayyib let's look at his absolutely unique one sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallama imam al-busayli rahimahullah ta'ala he brings he begins nabdan bihi ba'da tasbihin bi batnihima nabda al-musabbih min ahshai mutaqimi okay so he brings radiallahu anhu wardah the first face which is the 70 face face and some of the ulama they place this as part of the latter chapter and some of them place it as it's been placed in him check out the hakim's translation as part of the chapter in which we're dealing with which is the prophetic miracles they sang glory in his hand and then we cast like the praising jonah cast from the whale's belly and so he's bringing a type of miracle that relates to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ has miracles of different types, of different categories. Of the things that we know is that the Prophets themselves manifest miracles inside of their time. And as we said, miracles are signs from God that the person who is claiming to be prophecy, to have prophecy, to be a prophet, is true from God. The ulama say that if a miracle could speak, Okay, because remember the nature of a miracle, it's a communique from the divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you something. And so were you to sort of transcribe that, as Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala is going to allude to with the trees, as it relates to the Prophet sallallahu if you could transcribe what the actual miracle is saying, it is sadaqa abdi fi ma balagha anni, is that my slave is speaking the truth in that which he conveys on my behalf. That this is a true prophet. That's what the miracle would say if khalas, you could remove the veil of sound such that you hear calculate be yeah, in talaq with a very eloquent and free tongue. Okay? And so there are different types of miracles of the Rasul, and by virtue of them, you know he's the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa And you don't ignore the importance of miracles. Okay, because it's through miracles, we know the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the great Imams of Hadramaut, his name is whom? He's, he's Muhammad Umar Bahraq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. He said that there are two ways in which we can well, we, we, we uh, apprehend the reality of prophecy in and of itself, two ways. And what he's speaking about here, radiallahu anhu warda, are the degrees, the higher degrees of the reality of the experiential reality of this religion. Remember when we say ashhad, Allah ilaha illallah. And we say Ashhad Anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. We should often ponder what does Ashhad mean? What does it mean to testify? What does it mean to bear witness? Okay? And what does that mean? This is not a belief. And the ulama radiallahu anhu arda are careful to explain to us that that word Ashhad cannot be what well, cannot be replaced by another term. You can't say Ummin. Allah ilaha illallah, I believe. You can't say azim, I am certain. Allah ilaha illallah, you can't say that. Ud'in, I proclaim, I declare. Allah, you can't say that. You must say ashhad. And so therefore there must be a secret behind ashhad, shahada. And, and shahada is to witness. And it's to witness with some type of eye. And we have those who witness with the physical eye. And then we have those who witness with the metaphysical eye. Okay? You're either going to witness with ocular vision or you're going to يعني, witness with the vision of the heart, of the soul, spiritual vision in and of itself. And the nature of the miracles in and of themselves, there are two types. There are miracles that are perceived, 
that are perceived with the eye, and there are miracles that are perceived bil basira with the inner eye, with the eye of the heart, in and of itself. And so Imam Bahraq rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that a person only truly arrives at shahada when two things. One, that the third eye, the eye of the heart, has now opened up, that the veils have been removed. And he, he, that's when he will sort of veered into the world of people who likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will manifest miracles at their hands, which is the issue of wilaya. And the issue of, of sainthood, of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through divine protection and friendship. And the reality of shahada can only come about at the hands of such people. Because they're the ones, as it says, that they're the ones who ascend the great mountain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the Aqaba. And that difficult, steep road, the steep mountain, until when they reach its peak tops, then quote unquote, they don't just see the promised land, they see the prophetic land. And they gaze upon the reality of the, pro of, of the prophets. And a prophecy with not only ocular vision, but also, and more importantly, spiritual vision. And, and why is that important? Because that is what each and every single one of us is being summoned to. Yani, the prophets themselves come, they use that key, him to purify them, to, to remove the veils of the heart. So you can say, Ashhad an la ilaha illallah. You can say, Ashhad anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. You can say that and that be folk. That is your experience of reality. And it's not just a perception that you have or a belief that you believe based upon that which you've heard or that which came down to you due to culture or what have you. And that is not what this religion summons us unto whatsoever. Rather, religion summons us unto to absolute independence of everything illallah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And so the first way that we begin to apprehend the reality of the prophets is through the purification of the heart. And so purification of the heart is paramount. And then the second way, which obviously is something that mashallah tabarak the sahaba were favored with, is, that is through miracles themselves. Because the heart needs to be pure for miracles to become a causative reason for you being drawn near, drawn nigh to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one on high jalla fil ula. Do you understand? Or do we not understand? Okay, because miracles have a purpose. That is the whole point. And through miracles, alamatullah, ayatullah, these are signs of God as to who is the one is speaking. Who is he? Uh, that's how you know the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. And in order to know those miracles, your heart has to be pure. Two ways, khalas, la fa li fala. And there's no third way to know the realities of the Prophet himself, to experience the, the true nature of shahada in and of itself. Okay, so there are going to be different types of categorical miracles. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, that he's the universal Prophet. He, is, he was sent to all humanity We send you to all creation moreover I was sent to the, to the two heavy creatures, the ins and the jinn I was sent to the red and the black as he says He was sent to everybody without exception and everything without exception will witness the miracles of the Prophet But as the Rasul said, except those who disbelieve from the ins and the jinn. That's what he said. So he will not witness it as it is in reality. As we said, it just increases them in distance. As the Rasul himself, he said that everything in the heavens and everything on earth testifies as to who I am except those who deny from amongst the humans and from those who deny from amongst the jinn and of themselves. That's Rahmat al-Alameen sent to all, all the Alameen, all of creation, sallallahu alayhi What is important about that is that when you look at the miracles of the Rasul, you'll see miracles that relate to the angels, you'll see miracles that relate to the jinn, you'll see miracles that relate to man, you'll see miracles that relate to animals, you'll see miracles that relate to plant life, you'll see miracles that relate to minerals, you'll see miracles that relate to pure inanimate objects. You see miracles that relate to the entire corpus of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. And that's unique for our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Because Musa ibn Imran had a type of miracle that was suitable for his time and place and culture. And Ibrahim ibn Tariq had a type of miracle that was suitable for his time and place and culture. Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam had a type of miracle that was suitable to his time and place and culture. Nuh, 
radiallahu anhu ayyan alayhi salam all the prophets had a type a manifestation of divine miracles that had a suitability for time place culture person but our rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam all of those miracles first and foremost quote unquote he inherits all of those miracles any miracle a, a prophet ever did our rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam can do quote unquote and then likewise, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi has miracles manifest upon his hands that quote unquote the other prophets could only dream of. And by virtue of those miracles manifesting, those prophets who could only dream of it recognize who he is. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahih wa Sallam. Ayatullah is the sign of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as to whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Sahih wa Sallam is. And so we'll inshallah ta'ala in context I and mean, al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala will speak about a few of the miracles of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and they are but a few. Yani, Nabdan bihi ba'ad al-tisbihi bi batnihima Nabdan al-musabbih min ahshahi mutaqimi So here the first one he brings radiallahu anhu wardam and it relates to, to stone or minerals, relates to that type of well. And how stones can yusabbih that they can what? glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they're in the hands of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You see the tradition of a tribe called Kinda as an example, a tribe called Kinda. And the Kinda is one of the ancient names, it's the ancient name of Hadramaut, of Hadramaut, the people of the Yemen, the yani eastern province of the Yemen. And so the people of Kinda, they come unto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam and this is the ninth year after Hijrah. And then the people of Kinda, they say to the Prophet Sallallahu That then we've hid something, we've hid something, okay, for you. And we want you to tell us exactly what it is and exactly where it is. You know, what have we hid and where have we hid it? Now that's like sort of hide and seek or something there. You're going to try and play with the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because they're trying to ascertain, is he true or not? Is he a prophet or not? And look at the Rasul sallallahu alayhi first and foremost, the Prophet wants to show you something. That type of stuff, that even if somebody can tell you what is hidden inside of the ghayb, that is not necessarily a proof of prophecy. Okay? It's not necessarily a proof of prophecy. Okay? Because there could be yeah, another creature inside of the world of the unseen that has informed you of the thing. And that's the issue of the kahana, what we call the diviners or clairvoyance. In the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they inspire each other with what? Embellished words, with adorned words. And it's the world of the jinn, how the jinn can communicate to specific human beings and inform them of things that are inside of the world of the unseen. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi says, subhanallah, he says, glory be to Allah, hadha shay'un yuqal ila al-kahana. This is something you, you would say to a clairvoyant, uh, to a wizard, to a magician, to a witch, uh, to a diviner. Well, let's to be kind. I'm not a, a clairvoyant, the Prophet said. And so they asked the Rasul, then men yashhad, then who then is going to bear witness that you are indeed a prophet? And so the Prophet said, Hadi Hasa, these stones here. These stones right now are gonna what? Are gonna bear witness that I'm a prophet. I, I, they've not heard of that one before, huh? They've not seen that reality before. There's no precedence whatsoever. And so the Prophet وسلم, just takes a group of them. And how blessed they were now to be in the hands of the Rasul وسلم. And what does it mean for those blessed palms? And it's to touch you. And those stones now elevated by the Rasul I mean stone stones desired him. As the Prophet is a Sahih Muslim, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inni la a'arif al ahjaq. I know stones, kana tu sallam alayya qabla al ubaath. They used to give me salams before I was even a prophet. Yeah, that's old news for the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Sahih Wasallam. They call it irhas. In the, in the science of miracle, irhas is a miracle that happens to a prophet prior to prophecy, qabla al ubaath. Prior to them being granted prophecy, which is a rule, is at 40 years of age. 
and these stones dealing with the Rasul is old, ancient. Sayyid Ali bin Abi Talib, who said we used to walk through Mecca. I used to walk in Hadith al-Bazaar, I used to walk through Mecca with the Rasul and we would never pass by a stone or a tree say that it would say Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Kalam Sayyid Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. But this, this, yeah, it's one thing to give the Rasul salams, but it's another thing to be embraced by the Rasul, eh? to touch the Rasul. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. These stones bless it. But the Rasul now, MashaAllah ta'ala, takes the stones and places it inside of his hands. And then the stones themselves, they begin and to sabih. They begin to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's important here about the stones glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're pointing to whom this act is, yani, is ultimately yani, uh, yeah, finds at its source. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, they're pointing to Allah jalla jalala wa ta'ala ta'adhamatu ya'ani sadaqa abdi fi ma balada anni. That my slave is truthful in that which he conveys on my behalf. And shahada for the Rasul, he said, bih. In the tradition, you said bih, that their voices were like salt of the fadi'ah. They're like a croaking of frogs. That's how the sound of the actual stones sound. Eh? And then the Prophet is showing you the nature of hearts, true hearts. The Prophet then takes the, the stones and he places it in the hands of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa And then they carry on. You said bih, you said bih, you said bih. Glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the stones are taken from the Rasul, from Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq by the Rasul, and they're placed in the hands of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. But to sabih, to sabih, to sabih. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. Huh? And you must be saying subhanallah if you're seeing this, if you're hearing this. Subhanallah. Huh? Taken from the hands of Ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and placed in the hands of Ibn Affan, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. Wa tu sabih, wa tu sabih, wa tu sabih. Degrees. This is khilafat here. Hadith related by Sayyidina Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. In a riwayah of one of the people of Kinda, he comes and says, let me see those. And he takes the stones and qata'at, khalas. Take us for silence, huh? The heart, غير محيّة. The heart is not being prepared for this type of reality, huh? Munqata'. It's full silence, huh? And we do not testify upon the platform of you. We only testify upon the platform of hands that have been touched by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. But it's a causative reason for the whole kinder, for the entrance of kinder into the fold of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us by virtue of those who he was pleased with inside the age of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so the issue of stones, mashallah, tabarakallah, and the stones with the Rasul, it's a common occurrence of stones. رضي الله تعالى عنهم وأرضاهم سيد أنس وسيد عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه وأرضاه the big mention of that which akin likewise food the issue of tasbih we're looking at the سيد أنس سيد عبد الله بن مسعود said that we would eat with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the food would to sabih we could hear the food glorifying Allah how does that mean when you're eating food with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم you can hear the very food that is now being and anticipating the touch of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa sallam, glorifying Allah Jalla Jalalu wa ta'ala ta'adhamatu huh? I that the age of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a very very strange age such that one could actually even question the actual existence of miracles in the age of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you could question that from what perspective can you question it? with the ulama of Tawheed they say that if you live in an age where miracles become normal then are they even miracles? Huh? And miracles is just a normal affair. Because remember, the nature of the miracle is the suspension of the norm. And so when the miracle becomes a norm, yet our illusion is miraculous. If you get the point, it's like it is miraculous how we see the world the way we often see the world. And even more miraculous if you see the world of that way and you live in Ahdin Nabuwa in the age of the Prophet. Abu Sayyid Rahimullah Ja'at I da'wati al-asjaru sajidatan Tamshi ilay ala saqin bila qadam He says trees came prostrate to heed his call Their trunks walking to him Though they had no feet Hakada, mashallah, tabarakallah Again, too numerous The case here You can find traditions inside of al-Bazaar You find traditions inside of the Sahih of Ibn Muslim 
multiple traditions. The traditional that we covered earlier with Rukana, who likewise, yani, trees. Yani, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abhadu and Arabi in the Hadith and Bazaar, he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he wants what? He wants to know the, 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 the truth of what? Of the, of the claim of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's a prophet. And so he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yani, Man yashhad laka, annaka nabi. Who is a witness testify to you that you are a prophet? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, that tree over there. You see that tree over there? It will testify for me. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hadith of Rukana, we mentioned the Hadith of Rukana, where the Prophet Sallallahu wrestles the great Arabian wrestler, Rukana. After being defeated upon several occasions, he still doesn't enter into the fold of Islam. And then he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I want something else to testify that you are indeed a prophet. Who will bear witness? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, that tree over there. And so the Prophet said on multiple occasions, he's asked, go and call the tree. And so they go over and they call the tree. And then the Prophet وسلم, it's reported that the tree now, as Abu Sayyidi is, is, is making mention of, that the tree begins to move to its right, sway to its right. Then the tree begins to sway to its left. Then the tree sways backwards and then the tree sways forward. It's uprooted itself, the tree. Okay, trying to get itself out of here. Because you have an opportunity. Yani, it, yani, look at the Rasul. The Rasul don't go to the tree. The tree must come to the Rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell the tree to come here. And they actually go to the tree because some of us, if a man said, I'm a prophet, now go and call the tree. He'd be like, yeah, right, I ain't calling anybody. Go and call it yourself. And you're going to make me look like a bit foolish here. But look at them, the safa of the qalb, the purity of the people, the heart of such people. And when they're asking, MashaAllah, it's a sign that faith at some, at some level is inside of their heart. Because the response is going to be positive. And so when they go to the tree, here how you see the tree uproots itself. And the beauty of it, if we were to be watching the tree, then our only conclusion is that the tree is dancing to the song of prophecy. That's the tree. Look like this one. Look at it. See how he's swaying there? That's what the tree is doing. Huh? The tree is dancing to the song of prophecy. And it uproots itself. And in the tradition, you see it. Khalas. It walks. Although. Busaydi said, and without feet the way we have feet. But it has its own type of feet, just like it's going to have its own type of sujood. Sajidat. Huh? That it goes up to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, says, Men ana. And who am I? And if the Prophet says those words to you, Men ana, the only way it can be anta Rasulullah. You are the messenger of God. That's the wage of the tree. But look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates a tree because trees don't speak. Yes, and trees can prostrate. To sabih, trees can glorify Allah ta'ala as Allah will let tafqah, tasbihahum. But you don't understand the tasbih. Allah ta'ala says inside the Quran, but as for speak, I had an khasiyat al insan. Then that is from the peculiar, distinguishing, differentiating qualities of man. And so whenever you hear of a stone speaking, or a tree speaking, or an animal speaking, Allah Ta'ala has elevated upon the hierarchical pyramid of being into the world of man. So that it takes on the attributes of man and begins to speak like man. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to manifest when it connects to his Habib. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibi wa sallam. Anta Rasulullah. And the tree not only speaks with the tree. Like in Surah Al-Rahman, yani the Najm and the Shajar, that they can walk, that they can yes do it, they can prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what's the nature of their prostration? But the Najm here is another type of tree. One with trunk and one without trunk. The Shajar has a trunk and the Najm doesn't have a trunk in the world of opposites. But what is their prostration? But here the Bedouin, he sees prostration like prostration of man. Why? Because he then asked the Rasul sallallahu allow me to prostrate to you. If that tree can prostrate to you, then allow me to prostrate to you likewise. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi says, la, la yanbaghi. It's not appropriate for any human being to prostrate to another human being. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to permit it, he would, well, he would have commanded the actual wife to prostrate to the husband. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi says in a famous tradition. And so, Look at the beauty of the words. 
that the tree, it came on the basis of the call of the Prophet ﷺ. It was summoned by the Messenger of Allah, invited by the Messenger of Allah into Hadrat al Nabuwa, into the sphere of prophecy in and of itself. And it comes Sajidatan. And its state is prostrate to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam Tamshi ilayhi Ala saqin bila qadami Bila qadami Kannama satarat satran Lima kataba Furu'uha min bidi'i al-khatti Fil liqami He says It was as though their branches Were writing lines As they came along Sadaqa abdi Fima balaga anni Sadaqa abdi Fima balaga anni يعني إن ركع صدق عبدي فيما بلغ عني إن نسخ صدق عبدي فيما بلغ عني في الثلث and in all of the very beautiful ways of what of writing the beautiful ways of Allah سبحانه وتعالى to Rasul inside of Islamic calligraphy صدق عبدي فيما بلغ عني it was as though the branches were writing lines as they came along with the finest calligraphy he mentions رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه and that's you see many inside of that, the, 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 the Nabat, the world of what? Of tree life, of plant life. I will testify to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. Sometimes you see as we hear the hadith in Sahih Muslim of, 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 um, of trees greeting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prior to prophecy. Prior to prophecy we'll also know of trees shading the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. Likewise, with, with trees, you see here trees uprooting themselves to come unto the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa akhrab al-gharaib, and the most strange of them all is the hadith in the Sahih, Mutawatir, the hadith of that day palm tree, that cry of, due to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because in all of these situations, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yad'u, and he summoned them to him, he's embracing them. And this tree all it knows is the embrace of the Prophet ﷺ. Now went inside of the house, that beautiful woman from the Ansar, which she has a, a member built for the Rasul ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ leaves the actual tree that he used to lean upon when he gave his khutbah. The tree begins to cry and cry and cry. Cry and cry for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi in the Hadith due to Mufarakatihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam due to the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is now leaving the actual tree due to what it being accustomed to yeah, of the dhikr, the remembrance of God on the blessed tongue of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying Hadith Subhanallah Mutawatir you, you look at you look, why did the Sahaba yeah, preserve that tradition why did the Tabi'een preserve that tradition? Why did the Tabi'een, all of the generation, preserve that transmission? Such that if you deny the transmission, you exit the fold of Islam. No matter what the illusion is that you still believe in Allah and His Rasul, you don't have an atom's weight of faith inside of your heart. Because of denying the fact that a tree cried for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where is he going? It's only a few feet away. And all of us would be basking in light if we were a few feet away from the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, once you've been touched, you've been touched. In Ta'lama, khalas. Few feet is, is like the, the fearless echelons of the universe from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. Wa wa and there goes the Rasul. Look at, look at the first instinct of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back to the tree. And he begins, I know you're not a tree, but mashallah. He begins to, begins to caress the tree. Hekada. He's caressing the tree, sallallahu alayhi wa Look, the touch is important. Then he begins to speak to the tree. Now look at that, subhanallah. You know, think of it because sometimes we don't get it. We have to, to, to put it in our day and age. You see a man ca caressing a tree and speaking to a tree, what are you going to think? Tayyip. <laughs> see, that's the illusion in which you're in. And this ain't no illusion. And then the Prophet then speaks to his companions. He says, this tree, khalas, it was crying and all the Sahaba heard it due to the fact that I left it. And what it had become accustomed to of my remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I give the tree an offer. You can either remain with me inside of this world. I'll remain here, khalas. Forget that with a piece of wood. You know, even wood can be jealous of other types of wood. Huh? <laughs> khalas, I'll stay here. One. Or you, khalas, allow me to go to the other piece of wood and stand upon that, and you will be a tree in paradise with me from whom the awliya will take fruit from in paradise. Choice is yours. Uh, what's the choice? Uh, 
Look at the tree. The tree chose the akhirah over the dunya. It chose eternality over temporality. It chose proximity over distance. That, that's what it chose, the tree. That's why Imam Hassan al-Basri, Abu Huraira used to say, Imam Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu anhu, used to say, that a tree cried for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa antum, what about you? That's what he used to say, Abu Huraira used to announce it to the Tabi'een. Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, used to announce it to the Akbar Tabi'een. This is generational transmission. Trees crying, yearning to be close, to be touched by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which one of us has, have ever shed even a crocodile tear for proximity for the touch of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And look at the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look, look at the Rasul. You choose him. You choose the Akhir over the dunya. He commands the tree. Khalas. Cut the tree off. Cut it. Yani, cut the tree down. Means sever its life. You cut a tree down, the tree is dead, sever its life. It's like Dul Dul, the famous word, the famous donkey of the Prophet When the Prophet them died, Dul Dul committed suicide. Dul Dul khalas, the Prophet on me, touching me. And now we've gone to the, the Barzakh Dul Dul jumped into a well, committed suicide. And it, and it, what's the, 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 the value of life? After the Prophet has left the well. What's the value of life? Only somebody who's truly touched by the Prophet can understand the meaning of that. What is the value of life in and of itself? And so the tree, and it, if it could be the Akhirah, then send me to the Akhirah now. Call me right now. And the Prophet said, cut the tree down, 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 down. And thereby look at the Rasul. Could you choose the Akhirah? Over the dunya, remember, you get both, a dunya wal akhirah. And so the Prophet then commands for that tree to be buried beneath the other piece of wood, beneath the mimba. That's what it is to this day, beneath the mimba. In the message of the Rasul, it was buried beneath, so it's got the best of both worlds. The Prophet is still standing over it, on top of it, mashallah, tabarakallah, and it will yeah, and reconnect with the Prophet sallallahu inside of the next world. Huh? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that type of connection. Amen. And Allah Ta'ala to give us that type of reconnection. And these are trees. And we ain't trees and we're not stones. I mean, subhanAllah, that's the connection of stones to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the connection of trees to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then what about each and every single one of us? Huh? He mentioned Al-Busayri Rahimahullah Ta'ala, مثل الغمامتي النساء إن أن سار سائرة تقيه حر وتيس للحجير هما. He says, unlike the cloud, how it moved about to protect him from the midday heat, red hot. And that line it relates to what we call irhas. And this here are three prophetic miracles. And so these are miracle suspensions of the norm that manifest upon the hands of the prophets prior to prophecy. And we know that prophecy as a rule, it manifests at 40 years of age. When the prophet reaches 40 years of age in question, then that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them what we call outward experiential prophecy at 40 years of age. And every rule has an exception, and the exception, Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, who was granted at 30 years of age in terms of experiential prophecy in and of itself. Okay, so prior to those ages, as an example, Jesus speaking from the mahad, from, from, the, from the cradle, Jesus speaking from the cradle, that's what we call an irhas. It's a pre-prophetic miracle. And likewise, our Prophet وسلم, also spoke from the cradle, because what Quote unquote, good enough for Jesus is good enough for our Prophet spoke from the cradle. But likewise, in question here, the type of irhas he's speaking about is how here the, the, the clouds used to actually shade the Prophet. And the ulama are careful to inform us that the shading of the Prophet by the clouds is pre prophetic. That we don't know of any tradition where it's a mu'ajji that it happens after prophecy. We don't have any tradition, rather we know the opposite happens. How you will see the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum wa shading the Prophet with their wa, with their cloaks. 
shading him with their garments as the Prophet walks to the top, the sun would not beat down upon the Prophet and so that's a sign that there's nothing external to the garments of the companions that shaded the Messenger of Allah hadith in the Sahih al-Bukhari Bukhari and others but what we're concerned about here is the pre-prophetic miracle known as the Irhas of the clouds shading the Prophet once again on numerous occasions of the most famous occasions when the Prophet ﷺ goes to the great monk Bahira or Bahira, the great monk, when he goes to Bahira, the monk Sergis, his name is just yeah, in northern Arabia, huh? outside of Busra. And then he sees the actual protective cloud shading the Prophet. ﷺ. We know instances likewise of, of, um, of Maysara, the actual young servant of Sayyidina Khadija bint Khuwaylid. When he accompanies the Prophet all the way to Busra and for trade on behalf of Our Lady Khadija, he sees two clouds shading the Messenger of Allah. We also likewise know on the return of the Prophet when he returns back to Mecca al Mukarramah, how Maysara goes ahead, tells the Prophet to wait outside the city because the custom of the Great Lady is that she wants to be the one who greets the actual caravan and he's only doing that so that she can actually witness the clouds that are shading the Prophet and thereby she, he goes into the city Maysara and he, he beckons into Khadija from beyond the city and she herself witnesses the actual clouds and so he then commands the Prophet to go forth and the Prophet goes forth and then she sees the clouds moving with the Rasul and then he shouts the Prophet back and he turns back and so she's seeing the clouds Wherever the Prophet goes, he's seen the clouds go with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Akada Maysara. So Sinita Khadija witnesses. And those clouds have a higher reality. And why? In another riwayat of Maysara, Maysara doesn't use the word clouds, he uses the word malakan, two angels he used. Okay, which shows that Maysara, the heart of Maysara, we're seeing that which yeah, lies beyond the illusion in and of itself. That the reality of clouds and the reality of those who, who, who control the clouds are angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For amongst them, the archangel Mikhail, and for amongst them, the great angel Ra, okay, who controls the clouds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so that's what he's making mention of here, radiallahu ta'ala, and which the irhas, a pre prophetic miracle where clouds used to shade the Prophet just as the trees used to shade the Prophet from any type of what sun yani, yani, bearing down upon the Prophet Aqsamtu bil qamar al munshaqqi inna lahu qalbihi nisbatan mabroorat al qasami he moves on to something which is even more profound because now he's moving beyond earth uh, he's moving right now into two great realities the celestial realm in terms of the moon and yani, yani, the canopy of existence which is the heart of the Prophet they are the two things he moves on to by the moon split in twain truly it has I swear by an oath that is true a link with his heart okay he's saying radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa the splitting of the moon likewise deny Allah you exit the fold of religion Allah ta'ala says in the Quran huh? that, that the, the, Allah said the hour has drawn near and the moon has been split the hour has drawn near and the moon has been split and the beauty of that, because that's issued here, the Prophet وسلم, first and foremost, dealing with Quraysh. The Quraysh as disbelievers in Mecca, in the Hadith of Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud, in Sahih al-Bukhari, that they want a sign, an ayah, a sign that the Prophet وسلم, is a Prophet. But they're not people of belief. Yet they're not people who are beyond the illusion. And one of the beauties of that in the Quran is when Allah Ta'ala says, and the way iqtarabat is is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing the end of time close but the, the verse itself is the perception that people at the end of time they're attributing acts to the creation of God and not to the creator i.e. the inside of the illusion that's what the word literally means in the Arabic language that the hour is drawing itself nigh which the presupposition is here that somebody does not say Allah 
Allah, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said, that should our falls upon those who do not say Allah, Allah, you can't even utter the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are disbelievers in Allah Jalla fil Ula. And that's a context here. Iqtarabat al-Sa'a wan shakka al-Qamar. Yani, what wan shakka al-Qamar? That the moon split itself. That's important. Language of the Arabs. Yani, that it split itself. What do you mean it split itself? The perception of the disbelievers. Akada. Nah, this can't be true. It's only going to increase them in distance. Uh, to, uh, from Allah Ta'ala the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi But if we're people and, and who understand the, the, the precision of the term employed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is that Allah Ta'ala speaks here in dual language because those type of terms structured in the Arabic language they give us a sense of how you perceive the illusion and how you perceive reality very unique to the Arabic language it's dual perception and so in one perspective you're seeing people who all they can see is the illusion but from another perspective, there are people who are gazing into the, through the window of reality in and of itself and seeing the act of the divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're the ones who ask the Messenger of Allah to show them a sign. And what a sign he shows them. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. You know, like, what sign do you want to see? You know, like, people are like, mm. Split the moon. That's what I want. Split the moon. He goes, it's split. It's split. And when they look at split, Sayyid Abdul Mas'ud says, split such that khalas. One half of the moon was on one side of the mountain, and another half of the moon is on the other side of the mountain. And Hadith is Ahil Bukhari. And they look. They're like, what is that? First denial. Then they say, Sahir Ayyunina. Now, this is magic. This has to be magic, it's an illusion. So what do you understand by magic? If it is magic, and this is beautiful, if it is magic, then it's only us who's seeing the illusion. Huh? So what do they do? They send people to the Afar, send them to the Bedu. The Quraysh, send them out, see what they saw. Because remember, the, the moon, they're not like us, because we're all like cows, we never see the moon. Uh, we don't see it, yeah, we don't see a period, the moon. And we're too ga busy gazing at the ground, huh? never raise our heads up to the sky. Huh? And so they, ancient time, they raised their heads to the sky. And the news comes back to Mecca, everybody saw the actual moon split. And Imams have traced it, like Imam like Ibn Qayyim or Josir and others, Radiallahu ta'ala anhum wardahum, he said even you got tarikh inside of Yani. Thabat of tarikh inside of India, called the lands of Hind, where they even recall the splitting of the moon in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. This is beyond Mecca, beyond Arabia. The splitting of the moon is a universal phenomenon. And were you to be those angels who were like there guarding the moon of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And likewise, we're like, whoa, 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 what has taken place here? The whole moon splitting upon the commandment of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which is a real beautiful reality of the prophets in terms of miracles. Because what do they do with the miracles of the prophets? You see, when, when a wali, when a, a wali, the highest degree of miracles, other than the prophets, when a miracle manifests upon their hands, they are truly passive. Like it just, it manifests upon them. It's like you know, passivity on behalf of the wali. But the prophets themselves, you say, as Aisha says in Bukhari to the Prophet, what is it that I see that your Lord moves swiftly to confirm your desires? And the moon split, and the moon's going to be split. He, 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 he's passive from a perspective, but he's active from another. And that's how the prophets differ from the awliya. And if they want a miracle to manifest, it manifests right there upon their hands. And it's as if they are doing it. It's the closest you get to the, and I don't even experientially, that they are doing it. But there's another passive, you know, the, the prophets are complex beings. Nubuwa is a complex reality. So in them, you're always going to have these two opposites manifest inside of the prophets themselves. Because they are the true cosmos. Alayhi wasalam. And the nature of Allah Ta'ala's universe is opposites. And so the prophets, while they're passive with miracles, they're also active from a perspective at the highest degree. And the moon is split when shak al qamar huh? That's the face. Aqsam tu bil qamar al munshak. And I swear by the moon that was split. Tawheed. Yani Imam Busayri Rahimullah Ta'ala wants to give you a sense. Yani not him. That this is Allah Ta'ala. Because we're discussing miracles, and miracles are the acts of God. Because you cannot swear by the moon that was split. And man can't swear by the moon. Man cannot swear by the sun. Man cannot swear by the fajr. 
Man cannot swear by the day, man cannot swear by the night. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can swear by it all, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the act of Allah ta'ala. We, creation, we swear by God. God can swear by himself, subhanahu and he can swear by his creation, subhanahu that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you, you put a, a line under the waves of Busayri, Aqsamtu bil qabr al qamar al munshak. That the waves of Busayri there, he's trying to allude to, this is the act of God. Because he can't swear by the, the moon that was split. Okay? Inna lahu min qalbihi nisbatan mabrurat al qasami. And what he's saying here, radiallahu anhu wa ta, is this also relates to the actual splitting of the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. And so we know the i'tiqad in our faith, how many times the Prophet own blessed heart was split. Huh? That in the Prophet's own heart is split when he's five years of age. And if you see what's ever been said about his heart being split, it was split when he was five. It was split when he was 10. It was split when he was 20. It was split when he was 40. And it was split when he was what, 52, 53 years of age. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are all the aqwa, well, all the different opinions about when the heart of the Prophet was split. Although no doubt the stronger opinions, which we don't have a doubt in, is when he was 5, 40, 52, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for so 5, he's in the deserts of Banu Sa'id. The splitting of the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the two angels, Mikhail and, and Jibreel. You split the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's 5 years of age, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it, what's important about that, that's the seal of prophecy. It's, it's the seal of akhlaq and nabawiyah at 5 years of age, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, when he split at 40 years of age, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now this Khatam and Nabiyin, this the outward manifestation of the seal of prophecy, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the seal of the prophets themselves. This is Gabriel, revelation upon Mount Hira, when his heart is going to be split, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he's 40 years of age, in order to what? Uh, so that the real Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala comes into him in the great cave of Hira. And then the third time his heart is going to be split, وسلم, which is in the chapter after the chapter of the Quran inside of Imam Busayri's Burda, is the Isra wal Mi'raj. And when the Prophet is now about to ascend the heavens unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in order to see his Lord, which is, it is, it is, it's the seal of Imam al Anbiya wa Sayyid al Mursaleen. Okay, it is three times that no doubt whatsoever that the Prophet Sallallahu heart is going to be split. In it that we know that the heart of the Prophet is going to be taken out from his chest Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in Riwayah it's going to be washed in Zamzam. In Riwayah likewise it's going to be placed in, in a tusk, in like a goblet, which, is, which has ice cold fluid in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise you know about the splitting of the chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the first time when he was five years of age. This black cloth was taken from his heart. This is the actual portion of the devil as it relates to you, and it was flung, uh, flung by whom? The archangels. Likewise, we also know when the Prophet was five years of age, that the angels then begin to infuse his heart with faith, iman, and with wisdom, hikmah. Just like when he was 40 years of age, they infused his heart with faith, iman, hikmah, wisdom. And just like when he's 52 years of age, they infuse his heart with faith and iman, hikmah, wisdom, saying that they also add another fear, quote unquote, metaphysical fluid, which is hilm, hilm, lam, meme, which is clemency. Now he's infused into the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu a clemency being the overarching yani, sign or insignia of nabuwa, of prophecy in and of itself. And so this is the splitting of the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu that on what in dominant opinion only happens three times, although some have it as four, in uh, addition of 10 years of age, and some have it as what, well, as five, in addition of 20 years of age. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that his heart is split. And so by the moon, split in twain, truly it has. I swear by an oath that is true, a link with his heart, in that his heart was also split, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, more times than the moon. And that is a greater feat huh? uh, to split the actual heart of the Prophet upon several occasions. Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik al-Bukhari, he said that through the life and times of the Rasul, we could witness the stitching upon the chest of the Prophet from where his, what, his heart was split and where the angels had, what, had, had him and cleft open his chest. 
وما حوى الغار من خير ومن كرم وكل طرف من الكفار عنه عمي and by the goodness of nobility and grace by the cave when every believing eye was too blind to see him فَصِدْقُ فِي الْغَارِ وَصِدِّيكُ لَمْ يُرَمَ وَهُمْ يَقُولُونَ مَا بِالْغَارِ مِنْ أَرَمِ ظَنُّ الْحَمَامُ وَظَنُّ الْعَنْكَبُوتُ عَلَى خَيْرِ الْبَرِيَّةِ لَمْ تَنْسُجْ وَلَمْ تَحُومِ And he mentioned رضي الله عنه وارضاه And by the goodness and nobility embraced by the cave where every unbelieving eye was too blind to see him this he's referring to another one of the great miracles of the Prophet sallallahu which is upon the Hijrah where he migrates from Mecca to Al-Mukarramah sallallahu and he migrates upon the first three nights the Prophet sallallahu migrates in a southerly direction although Medina is to the north of the city of Mecca and the Prophet takes refuge inside of what? the cave of Thawr alongside his great companion who is a companion by consensus as mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and in this specific motif, this circumstance in Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and so they take refuge inside of the cave of Thawr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiallahu anhu and Busayri al-Abbir, the expression that he uses for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the word khayr yani wa ma hawa al-gharu min khayrin and by the goodness and the goodness is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is يعني وانا خيار من خيار من خيار صلى الله عليه وسلم he is good from good from good from good صلى الله عليه وسلم حديث في صحيح مسلم he is the خير صلى الله عليه وسلم ومن كرم and the كرم is أبو بكر الصديق رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه يعني كرم هي نرى من العرب صخا يعني generosity so he means by كرم هي صخا which is generosity and the رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم and the مدينة الصخا I am the citadel of Sakha, generosity, wa Abu Bakr, Babuha. And Abu Bakr is the gateway to that city, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His karam, mashallah, mashallah, is towards the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he is a protector and a comforter for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is heading towards Thawr, Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda, just like the tree, is on the right side of the Rasul. Then next minute he's on the left side of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Then you find him behind the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Then you find him in front of the Rasul And the Rasul Hey Abu Bakr What are you doing? Right, left, behind, in front Abu Bakr says I'm a God I'm watching you Khalas Watching from all sides That no harm is coming to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When they get to the cave of Fawr Then the Prophet Abu Bakr And he ensures the Prophet waits outside of the cave So he can enter and he can ensure that the cave is safe for the Prophet Sallallahu And look here, this is good. This is the issue of tawakkul. Yani, yani. This is the, the second of the two when both of them are inside of the cave. Yani, it's an issue of tawakkul. And it's an issue of tawakkul reliance upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. These are matters of life and death. Yeah, Abu Bakr said he goes into the cave where he knows he's inside of the cave. The cave is like a, yani, a snake's pit. That's the cave, it's a snake's pit, and you can see all of the snake holes. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq begins to take from his clothes, and he begins to what, jam up each and every single hole. He has nothing left, one hole remains. What? So what does he do? He puts his foot. Maybe the tree, Bila Qadami, the tree doesn't have a foot, but Abu Bakr has a foot. And he puts his foot right inside of the snake's hole. And then he sits, and look at the beauty here. The touch, the Rasul Sallam is beckoned in, then the Prophet lies down with his head in the lap of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Now, what is that, huh? Remember, look at the mokif. His head in the lap of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he goes to the barzak, is in the lap of Bint Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I mean, that's a, a khususiyah of that family. A family of companions, four generational family of companions. The house of al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala. The Muslim sleeps with his head in the lap of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I mean, that is ghibta. If, if you ever going to be jealous of a man, be jealous of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq right now. That is ghibt of that. You, the head of the Rasul is inside the lap of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And this ain't no dream. I had a dream of the Rasul last night, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his head was in my lap. It ain't the dream, like the dream of Saint Sophia bint Uyay, where she sees the moon, munshak, that moon, inside of the sky, the full moon, the badr, that it drops right out of the sky. <laughs> Right into her own lap, Saint Sophia bin Huyay. And the woman saw her name Sophia, which means pure. In the Huyay, 
the beloved living one, her name, Radiallahu ta'ala anha warda. She sees the moon in a dream state in Allah. And she's so innocent, she goes and tells her then husband about the dream. And her husband just slaps her in the face. Slaps her. Why? Because he understood the dream. The moon Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. He's going to fall right into your lap. You don't have to go anywhere, my dear. He's coming right into your lap. But that's the dream of the great woman Safiya, radiallahu ta'ala anha wa ardaha. For Aisha, it's no dream. And likewise, whom? For her father, radiallahu ta'ala anha, it's no dream. Her, the, the, the head of the Prophet said, inside with Allah, who are the Sadiq. Yani, there you get the, the snake starts biting the foot of Abu Bakr the Sadiq. Now, how you not going to move when a snake yani, bites you? Why does he move? He just wanted to disturb the messenger of Allah. And he, he didn't want to disturb. And he's just keeping still. Abu Bakr Abu Bakr begins to cry. The pain, cry. And look at those beautiful tears. Just, they just drop onto the blessed face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet opens his eyes and he just sees the tears of Abu Bakr Siddiq overflowing onto his blessed face Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ma yukika ya Abu Bakr. Why are you crying, O Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr explains to the Prophet what is a kid, and so the Prophet wipes a miracle, wipes over the foot of Abu Bakr and he was immediately cured. Some of them, Imam Imam Ibrahim al Bayjuri, Rahimullah Ta'ala, you know, he mentions that there were so many snakes who stung Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu warda that although the Prophet cures him some of the poison remains in Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and that's what takes the life of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu 14 years later that he dies because of those snake bites Bejuri says wahoo al that is the more common, commonly accepted opinion that Abu Bakr dies because of those snake bites he received inside of the cave protecting the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what type of generosity is this? Abu Bakr al Anu with his life. See, when he says, Fidan, when he says, I will sacrifice my life for you, that ain't lip service. Now, a lot of us, we can have sacrificed my life, I take a bullet for you. Lip service. But their people, not lip service. And the Sadiq, not lip service. That, that's on his obituary, Radiallahu ta'ala anhu warqa. Life sacrifice for Rasulullah Ahra, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he summoned them. Our some of them, our teachers say, Subhanallah, and you see these the snakes. The snakes were like, yeah, it's Abu Bakr, no, he fought. He, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi come to our cave. Yeah, the karam from us. <laughs> and you think the snake's going to bite the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You think so? Yeah, kiss him, maybe. Mm. Not bite him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the snakes, they, they, I'll be talking from our teachers. Snakes said, move your foot, what are you doing? Move your foot, yet. you want to see the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tala al, That is the full moon has now appeared inside of our cave. Huh? And by the goodness and nobility embraced by the cave. The cave embraced, look at the words of Hussein. Um, embraced by the cave when every unbelieving eye was too blind to see him. Yeah, Abu Bakr who says to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, if they just look at their feet, they will see us. I mean, look how close they get, they get the best tracker in Arabia, who can, yeah, he tracks the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr Sadiq right to the cave of Thaw. Uh, alongside him is whom? Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham, and Umayyah ibn Khalaf. The yeah, of Kufr, leaders of disbelief, who paid this best truck in Arabia to find the Prophet Sazim inside of the desert on the Hijrah. And how he did it, Allah Ta'ala, Ta they tracked the Rasul right to that cave. Abu Bakr right to that cave, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Radiallahu Anhu. And then he says, they're in here, pay the money, khalas, they're in here. Like in where? It's right there inside of the cave. Oh yeah, you mean right there? In that cave? So they had in that cave. Then they look at the cave. What do they see inside of the cave? Huh? He's going to say here. They were saying the name. They were saying that none drew breath in the cave while belief in the cave and the believer did not waver, imagining that for the best of creation the spider had not woven no web and that the dove had found no pitch. Because they just see over the mouth of the cave huh? a spider's web. Uh, they see at the mouth of the cave a, a, a dove or a pigeon's nest. And they're like, how is this? Pigeon ain't gonna build no home 
where people are. A spider is not going to spin web in such amount of time, that amount of time. And where people are, no, he's not inside of the cave. The man's the truck is telling me he's in the cave. I'm the best, he's inside of the cave. But like he's not inside of the cave. He said, I'll show you he's inside of the cave. We took one of our teachers in, in, in Tawheed, Sheikh Hassan Hindi, may Allah protect him and his people in Damascus. Huh? He said, look, look at Qudratullah. Look at the strength of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's omnipotence. That at this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes enemies and makes them protectors. How he takes Abu Jahl and he takes whom? He takes Umayy ibn Khalaf and they now stand upon the mount, on the mouth of the cave pushing away the track. You think we're stupid? And you think he's in there? No, no, you're going to try and go in there. You're not going to make a fool out of us saying he's inside of there. So those two men now, they become the spiders as well. They become the pigeon's nest. And they're protecting the Prophet sallallahu quote unquote, from themselves. Ah, Allah. And that's why Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala, he says here, they were saying that none drew breath in the cave. Arama, there's nobody inside of the cave. While belief in the cave and the believer did not waver. La takhaf, inna allaha ma'ana. Fear not, God is with us. Hakada, mashallah, mashallah. Wiqayat Allah. أغنت عن مضاعفة من الدروع وعن عالم الأطعم. God's guardianship made extra armor needless. Neither did they need lofty castles. You know that which men of steel ordinarily take as protectors, quote unquote, beside Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, armor. درع فوق الدرع. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Battle of Uhud, when he's wearing two coat mails. He has no need of coat mails here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the coat mails he wears are merely for us. How we interact with the world of illusion, the world of asbab. That's what he's showing us. As for him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why does he need to wear any armor, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And his Sahaba show you that. Look at the great yani, yani, um, Zihar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. The one who can go into battle with bare chest. He doesn't wear no armor. And if he doesn't know wear no armor, what about the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why does he need to wear armor? What about saying a Suad? Suad who's got ready for battle, bare chest, and the Prophet pokes him with his stick. He's getting on, yeah, Suad. Oh, awja'atani, ya Rasul, you hit me, you're there, O Messenger of Allah. Khawad, I want retribution. No, all he wants is just to touch skin to skin with the Messenger of Allah. Take off your armor, take everything off, Ya Rasulullah. Hassan takes it off, I want even Stephen. And then when the Hassan takes off all of his armor, then he begins to embrace the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why did you do that? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if this is my last contract with life, I want my last contract to be skin to skin with you. Huh? That's what he said, Sayyidina Sawad radiallahu ta'ala unto the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here what Imam Busayr is saying, God's guardianship made extra armor needless. He didn't need coat mail. Neither did they need lofty castles, utum, like ta'if. They didn't need to build their cities in the mountains, so it's hard for people to want to ascend unto. Huh? He says, radiallahu anhu ma samani dahru, dayman wa stajartu bihi, illa wa niltu jiwaran minhu aw yudami. Never does the age oppress me, but that I seek his protection. His protection do I find, and the oppression is no more. And his protection is the protection of the Prophet That's why it's يعني, يعني, small age. So never does the age oppress me, but that I seek his small age. His protection. I the protection of the Prophet His protection, only capital because it's a new sentence. My dear fellows. Do I find and the oppression is no more? Okay? I to be protected by the Rasul. Look, he's the wiqaya. He is the one that the protection to Allah Ali Sahib Sallam. Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu warda. He said when the battle got dire, we would take protection behind the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Sahib Sallam. And these are men of steel. But they, they move behind the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because yani, khalas, if you're behind him, mashallah tabarakallah. Huh? هكذا the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم. He says ولا he says ولا تمست عني دارا يعني من يديه إلا استلمت ندا من خير مستلمي 
Uh, you see that the most important is istijar. Remember the istijar of the Prophet Sallallahu istijar means to be in his jiwar. And the way jiwar in the Arabic language is neighborhood. It is to be his neighbor, his jar. That's an istijar, to, to seek neighborhood to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu And the most important time you need is istijar, and yawm uh, al you need his jiwar on the day of judgment. Those who are behind him upon the day of judgment, mashallah, tabarakallah, when his hand is outstretched to hellfire, khalas. Those are the people who are saved, yeah? By the reality of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, maybe it's upon that day we'll truly realize what the Imam, radiallahu anhu, wa rai is speaking about. Never do I seek from his hand the goods of both worlds without gaining my share from the best of all givers. Because the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is saying to Jabir, radiallahu anhu, wa rai, ma qala la qat. That's what he's saying, radiallahu anhu wa rda. And he's saying to Zayd ibn Thabit, tell us, yeah, Zayd ibn Thabit, about the, about the character of the Prophet sallallahu Of the things he says, ma qala la qat, he never ever said no. Never said no. You seek something from him, he grants it to you, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam. And that is qimam al-akhlaq. I mean, some of the ulama in the chapter of one, the chapter of miracles, they say the akhlaq of the Prophet sallallahu his character, that's the supreme miracle. And some say, no, the Qur'an is the supreme miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. But the Qur'an and the Akhlaq are synonymous. Uh, they're the same. Uh, and so that's what this opens up into the world of the character of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala has already alluded to. Uh, but it defies logic. It's not normal. It's not customary. You can't underpin his character with a law, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Not science, scientific law, and not natural nature, natural law. Huh? It can't be underpinned, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. لَا تُنْكِلُ الْوَحْيَ مِنْ رُوْيَاهُ إِنَّ لَهُ قَلْبًا إِذَا نَامَتَ الْعَيْنَانِ لَمْ يَنِمِ Deny not the revelation in his dream visions, for he was a heart which slept not, though his eyes slept, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It's of the peculiar realities of the prophets themselves and our prophet likewise. Is that the prophet says in the Sahih, he said that, he said that, We, the company of prophets, our eyes sleep but our heart does not sleep. Okay, what does that mean? That the prophets, even when they close their eyes, they're fully conscious of the world around them. Fully conscious of it. Even when they close their eyes, the prophets themselves. And that's our prophet and so he's encountered this with one of the miraculous nature, natures of the Prophet as he also applies it to himself. I, my eyes sleep, but my heart does not sleep, he says, sallallahu alayhi Look, look at the case of the Khatafani had, a Khatafani in the midst of war. With that Khatafani, the Prophet and the army of the Sahaba, they go to fight the Khatafani in the Najd. And the Khatafani don't show. And they wait and they wait, the Khatafani don't show. So the Prophet show, returns back to Medina to Manawara with the Sahaba. Upon the way, the Prophet says he commands the Sahaba who are tired to take to rest. And so they rest. All the Sahaba rest and they're tired. Every single one of them go to sleep. And there's the Rasul who goes to a tree. He takes off his sword, وسلم, hangs his sword upon the tree, and then lies down beneath the tree, eyes closed. And there's an assassin from Ghatafan who's trying to track the Prophet وسلم, and the army of the Sahaba. And when he notices that all the Sahaba are asleep, there he is, walking right through the Sahaba themselves who are sleeping, the companions, radiallahu anhu wa rda'hum. Tired, rapid eye motion. And thereby what? He comes to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sees the sword of the tree, of the Prophet sallallahu on the tree. And he takes hold of the sword. Then he stands over the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shahid, here's the point. Because he opens his eyes, huh? When he just stands over the Rasul, the eyes of the Rasul are open, fully conscious of what has taken place. Ya'ani, what does that mean? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let him get the sword. So you could see realities of the Rasul. And so the man stands over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Men ya'asimuka min ya Muhammad. Yani, who is going to protect you from me, O Muhammad? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah. And the Prophet says, Allah. The man shakes and the sword drops out of the hand of this assassin into whom? Into the hand of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Women. يَعْسِمُكَ مِنِّي And who will protect you from me? Note the point, because we missed the point. The man's an assassin. I mean, he's got his own tools of assassination. And he's standing over the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet was lying upon the ground. 
I know that like in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's the guard position, isn't it? Yeah? You can still fight from that position. It's an advantage to BJJ fighters. But the Prophet no BJJ fighter, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a divine fighter, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who protect you from me? And he, karam. And he, be the more noble one. He said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khalas with a sword on your way. That's him go, huh? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I guess I'm getting, I, mean, I know, I know. Don't worry, don't worry. And he, khalas with you. Ah, okay. 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 We're going to sort of read the, the other sort of the other um, the other um, verses of Busayri, inshallah ta'ala. We'll keep it sparingly five minutes, inshallah ta'ala. We'll be all done and dusted, inshallah. Uh -huh. Next, Next month. month. Ah, you can't tell the time, so. <laughs> he says, the 83rd verse, he says, Thus it was. It was at the outset of his prophethood, so an adult, his dream visions are not gainsaid. Taib, khalas, ya Allah, ya Allah. Any time we're going to leave it there, inshallah. Taib, we're going to leave it there. And inshallah, we'll continue this because it, it starts here, radiallahu anhu, with the issue of, of prophecy as well as the issue of revelation which leads into the chapter of the Qur'an so we can use that as the beginning of the next chapter inshallah ta'barakallah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam